Good afternoon and uh, welcome to the Standing Committee on Education and Economic Growth. Today is Tuesday, December 14th at 1.30. Uh, I'm the Chair, Zach Bell. I'd uh, just like to welcome uh, everyone here today. We have our uh, permanent members. We have Trish Altas, uh, Gord McNeely, uh, subbing in today for Hal Perry. We have Sonny Gallant. And we also have two brand new permanent members. I'd like to welcome uh, Lynn Lund and also Mark McLean. Uh, also at this time, I just do want to thank uh, our previous members, uh, Steve Howard and also Minister Hudson for the great work on this committee. And I believe Lynn Lund, this is a back to this committee, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so first thing I'm going to ask for is an adoption of the agenda. Gord, thank you very much. So uh, today we're going to be getting an update on the diversity initi initiatives rather within the public school system. We have some uh, guests from the Department of uh, Education and Lifelong Learning, as well as the public schools branch. So what I might get you to do is we'll start with Tamara. Just introduce yourself and your title, and uh, then we'll start a presentation shortly after that. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Tamara Hubley little uh, Department of Education and Lifelong Learning. I'm the Director of English Education Programs and Services. Perfect. Terry? Uh, Terry McAdam, Director of Student Services with the Public Schools Branch. And Kelly? Kelly Drummond, um, Director of Human Resources, Corporate Planning and Principal Support, Public Schools Branch. All right, well, perfect. So we'll uh, go right to the presentation um, and then we'll uh, open it up for uh, questions from the community members. So take it away. Okay. Oh, thank you. Welcome. Um, so we're just going to start talking about the fact that our, our schools in PEI are not unique um, from the challenges that we see in society at large. And so diversity would be something that we are seeing, you know, issues with in society at large and also in our schools. So from the schools, education and empathy building are the best ways to change discrimination and bullying. And as a learning institution, the public schools branch can utilize its strengths to educate its many stakeholders and work with our stakeholders and mediate situations as they occur. So as a branch, we're committed to ensuring <coughs> that our schools provide a safe and caring environment for both students and staff, and a meaningful education is best provided in a school community in which people can learn and work in an atmosphere of respect, trust, and acceptance. So the work that we've been doing since I think we last spoke, we did contract with Beyond the Brim Consulting and they're providing services in a kind of a full range of learning situations. So working with five schools currently um, as a sort of a pilot and at the same time kind of doing an assessment of PSB's diversity, equity and inclusion maturity. So the assessment will be across eight key activators, infrastructure, talent, culture, customer, community, brand, analytics, and leadership, and would leverage both qualitative and quantitative data. So then they'll be able to report back to us um, on changes necessary to improve and best practices for implementation. So the pilot program, as I mentioned, is in five schools at the intermediate and high school levels. So we have them at West Isle, Queen Charlotte, Birchwood, Colonel Gray and East Wilshire. So that pilot's working with educating staff and students and supporting a positive school culture and the development of a committee, which we now have the committees developed, consisting of students, parents, and staff to act as an advisory committee at the school level. And throughout the pilot, Beyond the Brim will develop a matrix for response to allegations of racism and, and diversity issues within the schools. So they would be looking at, we have a progressive discipline model, but they'd be looking at a progressive discipline model and saying, but what is the right reaction when it's something that's of a racist or a homophobic kind of nature, which is certainly needs to be dealt with differently than you might deal with somebody you know, smoking behind the bleachers. You, both would entail progressive discipline, and in both they need to have an educative kind of value to them, so that they're helping us to develop a new matrix for responding to those situations. Um, they've been doing some diversity and tra inclusion training for PSB staff, including topics such as microaggressions and unconscious bias. So they're working with the schools. Beyond the Brim um, worked with me to develop a presentation on microaggressions that I've done for all PSB staff, staff members at our office for all vice principals and all principals with the idea that they go back and deliver some of that to their schools. Um, they're doing third-party mediation to facilitate conversations and work through conflict. So we've been calling Beyond the Brim in with their partners to help us with, with situations that arise in schools. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> they're also helping us develop in collaboration with community groups um, 
better support and, and equity in our schools. So Black Cultural Society and Peers Alliance, for example, would be in those five schools. So one week it would be Black Cultural Society, one week Peers Alliance, one week it would be Beyond the Brim. So the students always know they have someone that they can go to and talk to about issues in their school. The gender diversity guidelines have been developed and undergone the consultation process, so it's anticipated they'll be released by the Department of Education and Lifelong Learning in early 2022. So just kind of next steps is to develop a strategic plan with human resources, student services, and EAL, EAL that lines up with the DEL and the Public Service Commission and to develop a rollout plan for gender guidelines. So when I had first written that, it wasn't begun, but it has. So we have a workshop developed for December 20th, and Dell can speak to the morning part of it uh, on the diversity, and it's for all teachers, and I think we're including a lot of other staff in that as well. And in the afternoon, the presentation was developed with my own staff, PSB, Dell and Peers Alliance, and it's all on the gender and diversity guidelines, and so we will be um, having that for all school staff. So teachers, bus drivers, QP 3260, everyone will be involved in that training. And then finally, to collect some data on diversity issues in PSB schools. And I guess the other thing I don't have in there is to develop a reporting structure. <clears throat> so one of the things that we have recognized is that some students find it difficult to report under the reporting structure that we've had. So I did go out and speak with one group of students already, and Norbert and I have two more meetings with groups of students this week and another one after Christmas to get their input into what they feel would be the safest reporting structure for them. So I think that's all I have, and then Tammy has additional from Dell, and then we're open to questions. Tammy? Okay. So thank you. Um, so in addition to the work that uh, the PSB would be doing on, on the cultural component of this and developing operational policy, the Department of Education and Lifelong Learning does have the responsibility for curriculum, for developing resources, and for the professional development of um, educational staff. And so um, I, I prepared a document that, that all of the members of the committee would have in front of them. And what it does um, provide an overview of the ways in which the Department of Education and Lifelong Learning um, has incorporated um, diversity within um, its mandate for curriculum resources and professional development. So um, the high level comments I'll make um, will be that the, the programs of studies that we have outline uh, basically the policy that we would expect be, that would be taught in our public education system. And so for each of those key stages in, in K to 3, uh, 4 to 6, 7 to 9, and, and 10 to 12, um, there are very clear guidelines in there for um, the ways in which we would expect not only students to be taught about diversity, but the ways in which teachers would also um, teach diversity. And granted, that's, that's evolving and changing um, as we, you know, um, daily, um, it's evolving and changing. And so um, we're on our own learning journey um, as leaders of the public education system. And uh, part of that learning journey is to recognize that um, the limitations of our uh, scope of experience and expertise um, and to work with and collaborate with members of communities that um, will really strengthen the work that we do in schools in an appropriate and meaningful way. Um, and so there are a number of things um, here that um, I, I hope you'll take the time to, to look at, but they do talk about policy. It, um, this document does talk about the, um, the curriculum and the, the very numerous ways, there's pages and pages here before you, the ways in which uh, diversity is uh, embedded within our curriculum. Um, but some of the things that I would like to draw your attention to, um, you'll find on the, on the last page, the last two pages, and they include the professional um, learning that we would have for our educational staff, and in fact, the many initiatives that have been 
brought into place um, since September when we were expected to uh, present um, prior to this presentation. So um, as I noted, we are on a learning journey as a leadership team um, and taking this um, opportunity to really um, learn from community partners and part of that, uh, the way in which we are doing that is through the work with uh, our diversity consultant who was hired in the summer and um, she's doing tremendous work for us as a community um, liaise but also bringing a lived experience to our work. And it's not easy work, um, but it's incredibly important work for us to do. Um, and so many of the things that you will see here on this list are a result of the leadership and direction that she is bringing to, to the Department of Education and Lifelong Learning and the ways in which we have been able to liaise with minority communities um, and really uh, address the gaps that we have within our curriculum, within our professional development, and within our, our resources. And so a, a few of those that, um, that are highlighted here, um, we, um, there has been community engagement, and so that initiative has just started, and uh, we'll, we'll continue to, to grow that opportunity. And so during community engagement, we will um, listen to the voice of minority communities and find out what is it that the education, Department of Education and Lifelong Learning can actually do to support you in a meaningful way. And there's a humility in that that's, that's very important because for a long time, we've, we've always said these are the things that we believe you need. And to take that and, and spin it and say, what are the things that you can tell us that we need to provide for you? It's a very important um, uh, change in our stance. Um, so um, just to add a little bit more to what uh, Terry was saying about the, the um, professional development that we are doing on December 20th. So December 20th, um, within the school calendar, is a provincial Pro professional learning day. And you can appreciate, I'm sure, that um, education has been uh, responding in the moment to various challenges because of the pandemic. And so um, aside from that, it's still very important that we um, do the work of supporting our teachers, and, and they've been asking for that support. And so um, the plans for December 20th in terms of professional development um, we, we've changed those, and it will be a day, a mandatory day, that um, all teachers um, in our system, including many of the support staff that Terry talked about, will be engaging in a full day, um, which is the first session of what we are calling PRISM. And um, so that will be a series of professional development initiatives that um, we will be providing for our staff and we are learning alongside of them as well. Um, and it's, it's a very important commitment and we'll, we'll start that work um, as a mandatory professional um, learning session on December 20th. And so there are a number of other um, pieces there. I, I'm aware of the time um, and I want to make sure that you have your questions answered. Um, so I'll just, I'll, I'll talk about um, the um, Indigenous Education Advisory Committee before I, I, I turn it back over to, to you for your questions. Um, so the Indi Indigenous Education Advisory Committee, committee um, is, uh, has been um, developed in order to provide us with a lens um, where commu community members can provide myself um, in particular with advice um, and endorse educational initiatives. Again, it goes back to the notion of um, we, we need to know what will be meaningful for the communities and for us not to be telling the community members what should be meaningful. And so it is through their, um, that committee membership where um, many Indigenous communities across the province are represented that they will tell us what are the gaps? Um, what is it that we need to be doing? What do we need to be focusing on to make a difference for students in, of our Indigenous communities within our public education system and PEI? So that's kind of a high-level um, 
overview of what's available and what we're doing. Um, so I'll stop there because I think it's, it's within the document, but I'm happy to take any questions and I'm sure Terry will as well. Thank All right, you. well, that's perfect. Thank you very much, uh, Tamara, and uh, thank you both for your presentation. So we will now open it up to questions. Gordon McNeely? Yeah, I just want to start by saying, uh, just recognize uh, a couple members in the gallery. Uh, Norbert Carpenter's here, and uh, Debbie Azuma Langston's here. So thank you for the great work that you've done uh, along in various aspects of this file. It's recognized. Um, yeah, thanks for, thanks for coming in. Um, this is a this is something that we've been talking about for, for a very long time. And I guess um, you talked about, and Beyond the Brim does a lot of great work, but they're only one, one organization and there's a lot of work to do. Outside of the work that they're doing, what is in place internally in your, in your department, or PSP or the department that's looking at advancing this? If you go to um, the second last page, you'll see there's a list of partners and um, they're listed there because they are engaged currently in active partnerships. Um, I, I'm reminded of uh, comments that uh, Senator Francis had made about um, the ways in which we need to take responsibility for the work that we're doing and yet um, we do need to have uh, the support of the lived experience and that direction from the lived experience. And so having identifying these groups, um, it's very important to acknowledge that they are um, comfortable in being identified as a community partner um, with, a, with the Department of Education and Lifelong Learning, that they, um, they are committed to helping us um, improve the education system improve our curriculum. And so, um, you know, it feels in many ways um, we're just getting started, but um, I can tell you that through our arts work and through our social studies work, um, the two curriculum leaders that have been um, with those files for a very long time, they've been completely invested in this. Um, and like I said, it feels in many ways we're, we're catching up to the work that they've been doing, but for me, this is my leadership issue, right? So um, acknowledging that there's work to be done and demonstrating my own commitment to, to that work and learning uh, um, is really the important message that I would like to share here because I think we need to um, uh, walk, the, walk the talk. Yeah. Gordon? And, and oftentimes we talk a lot about education and... and just came out of a meeting this morning talking about safe spaces and, mm -hmm. and how do we how do we make that better, especially for the kids. Um, can you can you walk me through? Let's say an incident, uh, a racial incident happens uh, to to uh, to a kid and they come forward and they, they talk. How do we know? How do we know where it leaves from the principal? Does it go to the principal or does it go to the PSB or mm -hmm. are all the incidents handled the same way? Um, Terry. So I guess that's kind of a multi-layered question because they aren't all handled the same way. And, and part of what you're, you're speaking to is part of what we're recognizing is there is a reporting issue. Um, so we're going to assume in this situation that the student has reported, but in lots of situations, I don't think they do. Um, part of the work that I just did with the principals was on microaggressions so that they could begin to understand that they need to hear what's being said when a student comes forward because sometimes when a student comes forward and says something you may not realize the impact that that would have on someone so just having that basic even understanding um, was where we started with the principals so oftentimes it will go to a principal and the first time maybe it would be dealt with at a school level some principals will call into student services right away um, some will wait until they're kind of at the the next level of the progressive discipline model and that's when we'll often have a consultant involved. But the one thing I would have to say that, and Tammy has said it very nicely, and I'm going to echo it, that we've learned um, is that we are not the experts in these areas. So that's why it's been really important to form some partnerships with 
with Beyond the Brim, with the Black Cultural Society, with Peers Alliance, so that we have people that we can turn to as well when students are in these situations and call upon to help us work our way through those situations. So that community partnership tends to be more where I would lean because I, I'm not going to pretend to be an expert or to know what it feels like for these students who are coming forward. So we are tending to, to lean out towards our community partners too. Did I answer your question? Yeah, yeah, you did. I mean, Gordon? It is, a, it is a tough situation. And these are, these are things that, that, that I'm hearing um, too as well. And you know, we have to look at it as, I mean, I know education is where the students spend a lot of their time and a lot of issues happen outside of education and brought into the schools. But, but we all have a responsibility to, to work on that. I mean, for example, um, you know, if, they're, if they're playing a sport, um, and there's there's issues on the ice rink, and then uh, with another person, and negative things get said, and then they come into school and have to face face that all over again. That's the trauma that the kids are facing. Are you are, do you work with organizations safe on the, the weekend where they're playing sports? If they come in, um, are you aware of it firsthand? Are the principals aware of it? Are the teachers aware of it? Um, can you speak to that a little bit? Well, certainly Derek. we're all we're all quite aware of of the situation that happened recently in Prince Edward Island. Um, we have not worked with Hockey PI on that particular situation. Um, I'd be happy to do any kind of education, but again, we're not we're not the experts. I think it would be better to have people like the Black Cultural Society work with with an organization like that. But we're always happy to. But does it spill into the schools? Absolutely. When things are said at the mall or at the supermarket or places like that. So part of what I would like to see happen is to help students build a toolbox of their own so, so that when they are outside of school or they don't have necessarily someone to report to, that they have at least some tools in their toolbox to help them to cope until they can get to a safe place with a safe person. Gord? And I mean, we're trying to wrap our hands around all the kids, and, and I think that... You know, when we talk about these things, we're talking about kids, and you have to remember that and try to try to try to look at that. If an incident happens more than once to a to a child around racial stuff, what happens at that level? If we see it occurring more than once, what happens for that child at that level? Yeah. So Derek? certainly, we'd want to make sure that the child had support. That would be the first thing to make sure that you know the child is being heard, and the child, and again that reporting structure, right? We have to work on that it's for the children that aren't feeling that they can report. But we want to feel that the child is heard and that the child is supported once an incident like that has happened. The progressive discipline model that we're, we're changing, um, the matrix with Beyond the Brim's help and Black Cultural Society and, and peers are involved in that as well. We're hoping that that will have a good education piece in it so that if, for example, you know, somebody says something to you that that person, instead of just being sent home, would be given some education around the impact of what they've done and what they've said has on the individual that they've that they've made those comments to. Gorge, um, I, maybe one more, and then I'll move on if that's all right. And I'll put you back on the list too. What? Okay, just one more in there, and I'll. What? So Black History Month, uh, February. What are? What have you? What have you planned for the education system to promote that uh, more so this year than ever? Um, Tamara. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so um, the the curriculum um, components that are within our, our, our school already, those, those will continue. Um, but we do have an initiative, and um, we struggle almost to call it that, but there is a project that uh, we're working on, and um, it's in its early <coughs> stages, but um, the intent is that it will be, it will be ready. And it will um, focus on um, women in particular, and it is a project that's been, it's not new, it's been under development um, and, and the intention that it will be, it will be ready for um, February. And so it, it might sound like it's just one piece, but the research and the collaboration for it to be an authentic representation of PEI's history um, is really quite exceptional. I, you know, it's important um, work that's been happening. And so to have that ready for our students um, 
it's uh, it's it's one piece of a very it's you know a lot of work that's happening, um, but we do have um, uh, existing curriculum that um, our teachers would be using as part of of uh, Black History Month um, in the ways that we would with other um, culturally um, curriculum that represents other culture um, celebrations as well. Thank you. Lynn? Thank you, Chair. And thank you all for being here today. It's uh, an important conversation, and I appreciate you making the time. I know I have heard from a lot of teachers who have already been really clear that, of course, they want to provide an inclusive, supportive environment. No question about it. But they don't always feel like they have the resources mm -hmm. to do that. And it's great that there's going to be a professional development day on the 20th, I believe you had said. Mm -hmm. But is that is that really enough? considering what teachers are saying they're looking for. I'm just wondering if you could speak to what other resources are available and what that's going to look like from the teacher's perspective. I'll speak first. Sure. Okay. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you, sorry. <laughs> no, sorry. Um, and, and you're right, teachers would, I would say, overwhelmingly want to do well and want the tools to do well. I, I agree with that comment. Um, in the uh, December 20th, in that presentation at the end of both sessions there is a long list of additional resources additional videos that people can go to and look at so that the whole day isn't filled with just the lectures and presentations there's also an opportunity to start exploring the other resources that are available is it enough no but we cannot we can't not do things because it's not enough yet. It has to be a starting place, and so that it, it is a good place to start. Um, and then with the work that Evelyn's doing in the five schools, we want to replicate some of what she's doing and spread it out to other schools. So, no, it's not enough, but everything has to have a starting place, so we feel like it's a, it's, it's a good start. Mayor, did you want to add to that? Yes, please. Yeah. Um, so you're, you're bang on, right? Uh, teachers have been asking for support, um, and we do feel that um, in addition to some of the subject-specific um, support that professional development that has been provided over the years, um, identifying opportunities for teachers, regardless of their subject matter, has been what's, what's missing. Um, so the 20th is a start, and as I noted, um, it's being branded PRISM, um, and uh, it, it's the intention that it is one of a series of uh, professional learning, um, mandatory professional learning opportunities for our, I shouldn't say opportunities, profession, mandatory professional learning for our teachers. Um, because it's the, it's the tools, as Terry noted, for a teacher to be able to address um, sensitive material, um, not wanting to be disrespectful to cultural nuances. But if you don't know, how do you, how do you lift that? So um, it's through our work with our partners, with our diversity consultant um, in particular, that we are um, in a position to grow our own capacity um, and, and really reach more teachers and, and obviously more students in the classroom. Um, there are so many great initiatives, um, the Turtle Island map, for example, and that's, that's work with pre-service teachers at UPEI. So, you know, I, I feel like we are um, growing our capacity, but as Terry noted, um, it, it's a start. Um, but it's important that we've made the start and, and we are working with many partners to make sure that what we are doing is worthwhile, um, that it, it is culturally respectful um, as we grow our cultural competency within our own team and within their, our um, colleagues in the schools. Lynn? Thank you, Chair. And I appreciate that answer. I would never suggest that we shouldn't be starting because it isn't the full package. Absolutely not. What I want to know is that teachers are going to have the resources that they need to feel like they can be successful in this space. And it sounds like you freely acknowledge that one day of training is not going to give them that. It's very interesting that there will be five pilots for diversity consultants within schools. Is that? Five yeah. schools that Beyond the Brim is working with. Yep. Yes. Mm -hmm. Lynn, sorry. Thank you, Chair. So could you give me a sense of what sort of resources those um, 
pilots are going to be able to provide to teachers in the moment. Mm -hmm. Terry? Sorry. So they, are, they have formed committees that um, have teachers, students, and parents as part of that kind of committee, as an advisory committee. They have, uh, as I said earlier, one week is Peers Alliance is there, like during the day, having lunch, being hanging out, being there as a resource. Another week it would be the Black Cultural Society. Another week it would be Evelyn Bradley from Beyond the Brim, so that they're kind of rotating in and out of the schools. So those would be resources that are available to them. I've provided some substitute time um, to Evelyn with those schools to, to be able to go in and do additional training and answer questions with teachers who have questions. And then she is doing additional workshopping with those schools um, on, on a number of different topics, unconscious bias being one of them, microaggressions being one of them, um, to build their capacity within the school. And then the teachers who are also on the committee that she's formed will get additional training and sort of be a champion for their school. Lynn? Thank you, Chair. I know you probably have others on your list, so I'll ask one more question and then you can move on and put me back on the bottom, please. Thanks. Um, I know, speaking of Peers Alliance, Something that they had raised is that the current diversity guidelines are in fact just that, they're guidelines and there's nothing that actually is enforceable. They don't have a, a there's not a way to mandate that they are followed. And I'm just curious how you imagine addressing that and moving forward. So, sorry. sorry, pretty much all of the guidelines fall under human rights, so they are enforceable under the Human Rights Act. Um, most of the information in there, that's where it, it falls under is under a human right. So in that way they are enforceable. They are coming out as a minister's directive, um, so that makes them also enforceable. Um, I, I haven't had that communication with peers. They, they were very much involved in the development of the guidelines. They took them, gave us much feedback, and we incorporated all of that feedback into the guidelines. So they were one of the first partners that we worked with on the guidelines. Okay. Trish. Thank you, Chair, and uh, and thank you. Uh, I'll also thank you for being here for this presentation today. Um, so I wanted to just go back to the um, the different um, groups and organizations that are uh, engaged in those five pilot schools. So you mentioned, you know, that uh, Peers Alliance or Black Cultural Society, I believe you mentioned, and other groups will be coming into the schools or are coming into the schools for a week at a time and, and, and kind of hanging out. Will they have any opportunity to, like, formally, you know, uh, present to classrooms or, or have a, a more formal engagement? I'm just trying to understand what that looks like. Terry? So Terry? Just so I'm not misrepresented, oh. it's one day a, during the week. Oh, okay. Each, each group would do a, a day a week, right, on a rotational basis, so they're not there for the entire week. Okay. Um, they, I, Peers Alliance already does a lot of presentations in our classrooms, and that would be outside of those five schools as well. But I know that they for sure have done some after-school presentations with teachers in the schools that they're piloting in. Um, I know Black Cultural Society is hiring another individual, or that's the messaging that I've received. So I think they'll be able to be more involved as that person is hired, so sort of someone that could be in the schools. Um, and I may have lost your question. Not sure if I'm Trish? Yeah, so and I do have, I guess, um, no, that, that was, that was a good, okay. that's fine, yeah, but I do have a few more questions on that, on the pilot. So first of all, what, uh, what grades, uh, what's, you know, maybe you can't say the specific school, but what ages are we talking about? Yeah, I listed them. It's Queen Sorry, Charlotte. The school. That's okay. okay. Queen Charlotte, um, East Wilshire, mm -hmm. Birchwood, mm -hmm. Colonel Gray, and West Isle okay. are the five schools. And, you know, when I hear pilot, I hear that there will be some sort of an evaluation. So, um, you know, sort of outcomes that you're, you're trying to work toward uh, you know, with this pilot. So is there an evaluation framework that can be shared? Terry? Uh, I can share an evaluation yeah. framework. I don't have anything with me at this time. Yeah. Right. That would be really yep. helpful uh, thank you, Chair. Sorry. That would be really helpful just to understand, you know, what I exactly the goals and uh, are of, of this the pilot, and uh, and, uh, and you know, to see if if, uh, if they're successful in, in meeting those goals. Would um, I give that to the chair? You can provide it to the chair. Yes, yeah, that would be perfect. Fine. Thank you. Um, so I'm wondering about the uh, the new. You mentioned that you're developing a new matrix uh, for the progressive discipline model, um, as well as a new reporting structure. So what are your timelines on on having those new uh, new uh, structures in place? Yeah. Terry. Sorry. 
Sorry. The no, progressive right. discipline model, um, we are we have one in place, but we are working on one that's that's for you know issues of diversity, racism, any of those the homophobic kind of comments that are made. So that will be ongoing throughout this year. But as situations are arising in schools, excuse me, beyond the brim is often called in to work with that school on what could be the outcome here for this for this one particular situation. So they're going in sort of on situations and helping them with them. Also advising me if I'm in a situation and I'm not really sure where should I be going with this, then I phone them and do a consultation with them on where should we go with this. So they've been really helpful on that. And second part was the progressive discipline um, so, so for when the uh, the new structures will be in place I guess oh for the reporting structure yes. was the other one that's right so as I said I've gone out and met with one school already and Norbert and I are going out to meet with two more this week and another one right after the Christmas holidays to get that information from children but we've also been doing some research into other districts across the country and what they use as reporting structures and Norbert can probably speak to it better when he comes down here but it's something that a lot of provinces are struggling with um, we've re reached out to organizations like the Kids Help Phone and though they can have conversations with children they can't then report back to us so that that wasn't going to be helpful but Interestingly enough, the children that I've spoken to so far are very low tech in what they're asking for. Um, we thought it would be a little bit more high tech, but they're saying things like a box in the school with a lock on it where I can put my comments. So those are the, that's all of the information that we're trying to gather to see what works for, for children. Um, because there's no point in us, I think Tammy spoke to that earlier, imposing what we think would be best for them as a reporting structure. We need to listen to the students and, and build our reporting structure. So timelines, we're hoping to have something in place as soon as possible. I know that's not really a timeline, but we recognize that though there is a reporting structure right now, it's not working for everyone. So we would like to get something in place as soon as possible for the students it's not working for. Trish? Yeah, thank you. And I, I absolutely appreciate that, you know, if you really want to understand how this is affecting students, uh, you know, and, and what they would what they would like to see and what they're what would make them most comfortable in reporting if they need to, um, that speaking to students is the best way to go. Um, I'm wondering if you've also been consulting with the Child uh, Advocates Office um, as, as they have, you know, uh, it's a different avenue for through which, you know, children and youth can uh, communicate and often do about these concerns. Uh, so are they have they been consulted? We've had, com we've had conversations with the Child Advocate Office in that they would share with us themes that they're hearing, but not individual cases. So it is a good reporting structure for kids if they want to go and get that support. But what we're looking for is a reporting structure that comes to us so that we're able to put the resources in the school that are necessary. So, so we do have some some of that conversation with the Child Advocate Office, but what they are willing to, to report back is themes. So I see a theme of this in this area, this general area. Um, so it is, it is one other avenue, for sure, for students to go. Trish, one more, and then we'll... Uh, sure, we'll yeah. Um, so and in your, your consultations with the Child and Youth Advocate uh, on developing the new reporting structure, um, have you asked or um, have they indicated how they feel their office could be best involved uh, in the development of the structure, uh, as well as, um, you know, uh, what their role might be moving forward? Um, and that might be a good question when Norbert comes down, because okay. he's been involved in those conversations. Sure. Uh, Mark? Trish took a couple of my questions <laughs> regarding <laughs> guidelines and so on and so forth. Just the, again, I guess when I look at this, the, you know, how to, to develop a role of plan for gender guidelines, like how long will that, I agree it's a starting point, it will ever be an ever evolving document, but is there, a, is there an end, you know, a launch date, so to speak, to, to, to implement? And then I guess my second question is kind of part of that is, is how does the PSB collect the data on diversity issues in schools? How, how do they do that? Terry? Thank you. So the beginning of the rollout for the guidelines is how December 20th, how that afternoon came about to be developed. And that's what we do is we introduce the guidelines and we give some... It's actually a very good professional development. Um, we give some opportunity for people to reflect on their own, you know, biases or 
um, questions that they might have. So the guidelines are very much the front of the of the afternoon session. So that's only the beginning because that's just staff. Um, there's still students that it needs to be rolled out to so that students have an understanding of what's in the guidelines and what it means for them as individuals and what it means for their friends and their family. So that will be step two. We'll be starting to roll it out to students and that should happen fairly soon after the new year. Um, but there was two questions. Just to, yeah, how do you collect the data on diversity oh, issues? Yeah. What's the process for that? It's a process that we really need to work on. I'll, I'll be right up front about that, that we do need to, to work on that because sometimes there'll be a report just made at the school level, then other times it might be made with a consultant involved, then other times it might come to me. So that's an area that we do need to bring together. We do see them sometimes on incident reports that come in and we do keep a database of incident reports or on school suspension reports. We do keep a database on that. But one strictly on was it a diversity issue we hadn't created, but it's been something that I've been saying we, we do need to do that and we need to do a better job of it. Okay. Mark? Last question. Just, I guess, the Peers Alliance, they're talking about the role of GSAs in schools. Is mm -hmm. that is that being discussed or it seems... Ma Terry? Yeah, Fairly many effective. schools do have a GSA. They do, and, and we certainly support them in having a GSA within their building. So... Uh, do, I don't know the number of schools that have them, but many do have a GSA. Thank you. Sonny? Hi, Joe. Thank you very much for your presentation. I just have just two questions. Um, so your community partners, were they involved in the curriculum, or are they going to do it when they come in one day a week? Me? Tamara? Yep. Yeah. Um, so our partnerships with uh, community um, members uh, has been go ongoing for a very long time. What, um, what we're ramping up, for lack of a better word, is um, the volume and um, the intentionality here because um, we've carried on developing curriculum um, and involving partners, and, and I'm very um, I'm proud of the work that the team has done, um, but it had tended to be isolated to the arts or um, social studies or the physical and health um, education um, curriculum, and which are very appropriate places um, to um, highlight these aspects of, of student learning. However, um, this needs to transcend all of our curriculum, all of our subjects in all of our grades. And so, um, we, as a team at the um, in English Education Programs and Services, um, are learning where in where would we actually um, talk about indigenous ways of knowing and being in math or in science, and and it's there. Um, but we need to do that work, and and we need to um, uh, take that learning journey as well. Um, so the being very intentional, um, broadening the scope um, of the work that's happening. Um, to expand what has been happening. Um, so I'm not okay. sure if that answers your question. No, that, that's Sunny. Answers and, and it's wonderful to see that happening. So as far as uh, the reporting of, of any incidents, so you had mentioned that the principal may take one route or, or wait. Um, so as far as the whole school structure, like are the school bus drivers and the custodians, is everybody involved in this or is it just like where does where does that fall? Terry? So the, the training on December 20th is going to involve all school staff. So that will be probably the first time that some of our school staff will have been involved in that type of training. So as far as the reporting goes, I mean, I would hope a student would go to whoever they felt safe with. There would certainly be no boundaries on who you could talk to. Um, but most, most students tend to go to a principal or a teacher. Some schools, some students are not comfortable doing that, and that's why we're looking at the reporting structure. So, great idea to tell the kids you can go to any safe adult. Yeah. Gordon? Um, how is or is the minister included on diversity issues? How does that? To bear? Or whoever wants to. Sure. So, um, at the Department of Education and Lifelong Learning, uh, where we have um, information that's brought forward uh, from our partners, um, the the minister and the deputy minister 
Um, again, looking at it from a policy lens because that's kind of our mandate. mandate and I'll, I'll defer to uh, Terry from the operational side. Um, but any time that um, there's um, a question about diversity, training, curriculum, um, the minister and the deputy, um, we would have a, a very intentional conversation about, about that. Um, and it, it happens fairly regular, um, uh, which is a great thing, um, that we're having these conversations on a regular basis. And then from an operational point of view. Terry. So I have briefed them, and when we, I do quite frequent briefing notes, and when we did um, consult with Beyond the Brim prior to hiring them, I had Evelyn Bradley meet both the minister and the deputy minister so that we could discuss what we saw as being our needs and make sure that you know she was the person that was going to fit our needs. So we do keep in pretty close contact around many issues that happen in the schools. Gord, thanks for your answers. Um, just a, a few questions um, on human resource issues. Um, so at, at the PSB, what is the percentage? Not, uh, what is the percentage of people of color in the PSB management teams? Part of our management team. Yeah, <clears throat> Kelly. Uh, yeah. So with regards to management team, there's none. Gordon. Gordon. But we do have a very Gordon, diverse sorry. staff as a whole, and you know it's interesting because numbers are sometimes challenging to collect. And I've had lots of discussions with the Public Service Commission around this as well because we really leave it to people to self-disclose if they belong to a minority group. Um, but you know, we've had a tremendous interest from a lot of different, um, a lot of different cultural, cultural backgrounds um, of people that come work for the public schools branch, especially our bus drivers. And so I thank Sunny for actually mentioning other staff because they're a very, very important role in the whole, um, our whole, embracing diversity and really this whole strategy because we have more support staff than we actually do teaching staff and they're very present um, with students and so you know it's an important to recognize yeah. that yeah uh, Gord and it's a tough question for me to ask and it's I guess it's a tough question yeah. for it to be around but I wanted to make it a comfortable space mm -hmm. because that's part of the that's that's part of the issues where we're looking at and that's that's the questions when I'm talking to families that's what they're saying that's what I just had this conversation yesterday with somebody um, so I, I want to know like is it something that we can look at exploring outside of PEI you know when, when people say well they're just not applying for the positions and I know that's some of the things mm -hmm. that we're not we're not applying for. well we can't keep running in a circle and doing that um, is there any opportunities that we can look outside of, of Prince Edward Island to actually go and try to do and keep in practice equity hiring yeah and you would, thank you you would have saw on Terry's note um, just with regards to the development of a strategic plan that very much um, incorporates human resources and it's really to try to, to try to address those very issues Gordon and and, and do better, and we all know that by having diverse perspectives, we just excel, right, in many, many ways. Um, but it, it is one of our challenges. We don't have a lot of people applying for our positions, and it's not just the public schools branch. Like right now, many government organizations, but even in private industry, um, it's really hard to get to get workers, to get people to come and work. And, um, you know, we're, we are doing some recruitment um, initiatives even just to address our requirements around bilingualism, let alone diversity, right, to try to bring people in. And, and our, um, ex our leadership positions do get posted more broadly than just Prince Edward Island. So um, those, those opportunities are probably easier for people to access. Um, but we do work in unionized environments as well, and so we need to identify barriers. And so one of the conversations we've had in the past is, is trying to understand 
um, you know, why we don't have um, more of even our students, our diverse population at UPEI applying for substitute jobs, for example. And, um, and part of the challenges there are around their status and so having to work with immigration to figure out ways to open doors for them so that they can actually apply for positions because a lot of, uh, of our positions aren't permanent. They're casual and substitutes. Like we can't survive without our substitute and casual staff. We rely heavily on them. But if we can't offer permanent employment, some of the restrictions they face are around their, their work visas and whatnot. And so we have to come up with creative solutions to try to navigate. And on the immigration side, the rules change all the time, like with, with federal rules and provincial rules. Um, but that will all be incorporated in, into our strategy. So maybe we'll get invited back down the road and be able to give you some, some good news stories in that area. Yeah, and that was good. I'll go one point. more, and then I can put you on the, on the list oh, Okay. Yeah, that was yeah. kind of my next question was, where, like, how are we working with the university? Because they're, they're, they're graduating, and we do it for other fields, and, and we need to diversify. Our, we all want to do that. Yeah, and we have to, to figure out, that's what I'm saying, is how do we do that? So I'm glad that you're thinking about it, and the strategies coming along. Pass the floor. Okay. Thanks. All in. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I noted in summer that Executive mm -hmm. Council had appointed an anti-racism policy advisor and an anti-racism table. And I was just curious how PSB and the department is engaging with those bodies. Um, so within the Department of Education and Lifelong Learning, we do have um, uh, uh, positions, um, staff, that would work in collaboration with that particular table and, and bearing in mind that it's executive council, so, so there are structures in place for that to happen. And so um, the, the work that my team would be doing um, through me would be um, looking at the uh, Indigenous Relations um, Secretariat, the advisory of the Secretariat that's been established. And so um, we consult um, what, what education can do and, and provide um, support. Uh, and, and collaboration where possible. So um, there are a number of different opportunities for that to happen, and um, it it's, it really depends on on you know like my um, curriculum leaders would would work with other staff members of various intergovernmental agencies, and I would work with directors and so on, and ministers with ministers and deputies with deputies. I'm not sure if that answers your question or not. Lynn? Thank you, Chair. So it doesn't sound like the anti-racism table <coughs> has provided any direct feedback to this process. Is that? Tamara? Thank you. Um, so the anti-racist table, um, I don't have a direct communication. What I would, I would be working um, through our structures um, to have that collaboration. And as I noted, the curriculum leaders would be working with other staff persons um, within government. Um, so I, I wouldn't have direct access to the table, no. Lynn? Thank you, Chair. I was curious if they had provided any recommendations or if there was like a list of feedback that they have provided to this process. It sounds like if that exists, it's not readily available. So with Come here. sorry. So within the work that we're doing um, in terms of curriculum and professional development, the the um, community members that are listed in the document um, have been they they are our steadfast um, advisors on this, and so um, not to discount what's happening within government, um, but our work really is um, within the education. What are we doing in a classroom? And so it's a little bit different in terms of um, anti-racist. Uh, ours is really about developmentally appropriate um, messaging um, concepts and so on that would happen uh, within a classroom setting. So it's a little bit different. Lynn? Thank you, Chair. Just one other question, if I may. We've gone back to the community partners a number of times, and that's fantastic. I know Peers Alliance and the Black Cultural Society, for example, do amazing work. And I also know they are on very limited and stretched budgets. Are they being compensated for this work? I'm aware that they're going to be uh, coming into your schools, I believe we said one day a week. Will there be additional resources provided to them on top of the limited budgets that they already have? 
So when they're Fair. coming into the school with beyond the brim, that's beyond the brim that's that's bringing them in. So I don't know what kind of an agreement they would have with beyond the brim, but that's how that was arranged. And the coming into our classrooms, they've been doing that for quite a few years, and it is part of their mandate to go into schools and educate students and work with classrooms. So we haven't compensated them financially. We've helped to arrange those, the, their ability to come into the school and give them space and give them access to classrooms. Thank you, Chair. I will just add that when we're having our budget discussions, that will be well worth noting. So, thank you. Thanks. Uh, Trish? Thank you, Chair. Um, so you mentioned uh, some of the challenges around, uh, you know, uh, hiring new students out of UPEI um, who are, you know, um, uh, who f are from different countries, They're, you know, and that barrier in terms of um, not being able to hire them for casual positions uh, because then they, they don't qualify uh, in, in terms of immigration status. So I'm wondering, you mentioned creative solutions. So this is not a new issue, obviously. So what are some of the creative solutions that you've tried um, and, and you know, what happened with those? Yep, so I guess there's, there's two pieces there. Um, well, we've worked with the Public Service Commission, so uh, I'm sure maybe you're familiar with TLAC's division on the diversity piece. Um, and so we make sure now that all of our job postings go directly to him. So they're resourced and really look at credentialing. So that helps kind of um, break down some barriers for staff uh, or for people to come in and work for us because they think credentials is a big challenge um, for many um, of our, our immigrant population who are here in the province. And so we, we utilize that, um, that division to help us. Um, discussions with immigration just on um, can we offer guarantee of employment? So it's not a permanent status, but if we can provide in writing that we can guarantee a number of hours. And so that's a way to navigate through like our obligations under our collective agreements, but also being able to provide a level of commitment so that we can open doors to allow people um, to come in and work for us. Um, we do meet with uh, the like the UPEI graduate programs. Right now it's been particularly focused on, on the BED program, um, but in the new year we'll be looking at um, some of the other undergrads, so, you know, um, speaking to students who are in the business program and the arts program um, to tr really try to promote opportunities within the public school branch and hoping that we'll be able to um, engage them in different opportunities that w we can offer. Uh, but again, like it, it needs to be a very consultative, like a we really need to work collaboratively, I guess is the better word, with our, our, our two unions as well as um, groups like Immigration and Public Service Commission to really identify the boundaries. Yeah. Terry? Um, I, I think one of the good things that came out of the pandemic was our use of Zoom as well. So this summer, every single person who applied to me for a school counselor position, I responded to and ask them if they'd like to have a follow-up conversation. And as it turned out, many of them were from other countries. And so I was able to have Zoom calls with all of those people to talk about what we would look for in a qualified candidate and how to go about you know, applying into the public schools branch. So I did have a lot of those conversations. That was on Kelly's advice to reach out to everyone. And I think it did open some doors. And hopefully we'll see more of those applications coming in. Um, Trish? Oh, sorry, Kelly. Oh, sorry, I just wanted to add um, as well, Trish, is that we, we did go to the job fair with immigration as well. And so, again, like talking about the different positions we have and really trying to help individuals make connections based on their experience, which may be different, but there's lots of tran um, transferable skills. And so, um, again, like trying to get face-to-face -face with people, whether that's virtually face-to-face -face or whether that's in person, just to try to understand for them. Like what 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 barriers are you facing? Because we're not seeing the applications, and so it's a, it's a different way of recruitment, right? It's no longer just putting a posting up. You almost have to tap on the shoulders to say, "Hey, do you know we're over here, and we have some really great opportunities to want to come and work with us?" So, Tamara, uh, I just wanted to make a comment. Um, about the funding of various community organizations. And I wouldn't have the information here, but we are funding various communi community organizations to do that educational piece. I just wanted to make that comment, but I wouldn't have the details of that. Okay. okay. 
Thank you. Trish? Uh, thank you, Chair, um, and, and thank you for, for adding that. Um, going back to the uh, the idea of being able, able to provide guaranteed hours, so uh, you, you uh, mis mentioned that as one possible solution. So is that something that you've been able, that you have been able to do and has been successful uh, in some yeah, cases? We, we, ha we have been able to offer that, um, but it's a very competitive market right now. And so for a lot of the positions that we can do that um, with, they're not... Um, education positions, so they're more of our support positions, and so one of the challenges we face is a competitive market, and so when we're only offering six hours a day, for example, um, for some of our roles, for example, like an educational assistant, we're competing against other employers who can offer 40 hours, so um, it's, not, it's not just about some of the it's not just about the barriers around employment status or work visas. That's one of them that I mentioned, but it's just also a very competitive market. Trish? Um, going back to the, the training for teachers that's happening on the 20th, so you said it's called PRISM. or that's, Is that uh, an established uh, training program then, uh, evidence-based, or was it developed in-house? Uh, it was developed, in, or it is being developed in-house. We're putting the final touches on it. Um, and so I, I feel really important to say that we have a, a, a staff um, that it, their job is to develop quality, evidence-based uh, professional learning modules. So I'll, I'll start with that. And so they've been spearheading this. And the content, of course, is coming from our partners um, and for um, staff who would have that background in order to provide that content. Um, but I think it's really important that, you know, we're, we're not just a bunch of people pulling together a day worth of material. Uh, it's, it's a staff that's actually, um, they're experts in training for adults. Um, and they've been tasked with um, providing this day of, of learning for, for all of our educational staff. And in the afternoon, sure. it's, it is very much it's peers alliance, um, the department, and our school counselor, our counseling consultants that are putting the material together. So again, it's it's done with a, a lot of fidelity. It's not just handing out materials. There's a lot of fidelity to what's being put in, out there. Trish. And so in developing, um, the staff developing this new training, um, so have they've been consulting with these different organizations then directly as well on, on that. Um, okay, and is there um, you know, diverse representation in the staff team um, as well or, or no? Can I ask a question to clarify? Yes, yep. So within the Department of Education staff team? The staff that's working on developing this, the diversity training, the PRISM, and yes. is, is that an acronym also? It is an acronym. Okay. And <laughs> Can I ask somebody to, to speak to that? I'm going to allow it, yes. Thank you. <laughs> oh, no, wait, hold on. <laughs> oh, oh, sorry, I can't speak from the gallery now. Right. No, sorry. Okay, well, I'll so just, I will get that for you. That's fine. Um, <laughs> but it is an, an acronym, and, and uh, I, I'm embarrassed that I, I, I did say I need to have that acronym for today. Um, and it's very new, um, but it is an acronym, and we wanted it to reflect the fact that... Um, that this is a series of professional learning um, that we are providing because one and done is just, I mean, it's just unacceptable. So um, I will get that for you, Chair, and, and you can distribute that to your members. I think it might be being written down here as we speak. Uh, one, more, one, more yeah, one more question, <laughs> Trish. Just one more uh, question, yes, about the uh, Indigenous Education Advisory yeah. Committee. So I just was wondering um, uh, a little bit about what, what role that this committee um, plays um, in you. terms of, you know, the, the work of, so you mentioned that the committee is consulting directly with, I think Terry said directly with you, um, the Indigenous Education Advisory Committee, sorry, okay, um, uh, what role does that committee have with the diversity consultant and, and that work? Is, do they have a direct link? Yes, they do. Oh, okay. Okay, go ahead, Tamara. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I, I think I missed part of your um, comments, so I'm, I, if I'm, not responding accurately, you just um, redirect me. So um, the Indigenous Education Advisory Committee, um, it's, it had a very difficult start up because of, of COVID and we were trying to initiate it then. So um, it's, it's up and running now and, and we have um, uh, a variety of community representatives on that as well as our own staff, including our diver diversity consultant. 
and, and yeah. the, the acronym is Promoting Rights, Identity, Self-Actualization self <laughs> of Minorities. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, Gord. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to, to check in, and, and I, I worry about the mental health of all, all the kids recently, but um, especially around this topic, too. Um, what part of the student well-being teams, which are a great thing, what part, how, how do they fall into the mix of supporting the, 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 the child when, when situations arise? Terry? So, so I, I agree with you. I also worry about the mental health of, of many students at this particular time. Student well-being team typically takes a referral from our school counselors. So if it's a situation that the school feels like this is a little bit bigger, this child is um, needing a little bit more support than what we would typically offer, they'll make the referrals on to the student well-being team. So to say, you know, would it be around diversity? Maybe. It might also be around other mental health concerns. So it wouldn't be that there's a special person or a particular person on the student well-being team that you would refer if it was an issue around diversity, but you would refer if the child needed more support than the school was currently able to offer. So. Gordon? Um, the, we talked about the reporting structure, and I, I think this is, a, this, this, is a, this is a major spot, and I'm, I'm talking to people right now that you know, we have we have an incident that happened, but but there are incidents happening in Prince Edward Island, and I'm I'm worried, and I want to know that I've got to be reassured that there's something we can do. Pri privacy of the child is number one. Privacy of the family is number one. But we need to reach out to find out these incidents happen because there's parents that are that are getting worried about, you know, they they go from that rank or they go from that pitch or field or wherever, and they come to school and nobody knows about. It. There needs to be there needs to be a mechanism there to to make sure those are those are front and center in the child's safety and they feel safe. Yeah, I agree with you, and and it is something that has really come up as a as a concern for us that we did put reporting mechanisms in place, but they're not working for all of the children. And I would encourage you when you're having those conversations with families to let them know how important it is to a report, but b give us feedback on what they would see as a safe report reporting mechanism. And some of the conversations I've had with children are, I don't want to be seen going into the office, or I don't want people to know that I told. Um, so so we're, we're definitely looking to address that situation and find safe reporting means for children um, where they feel like they can come forward with their concerns. Yeah. Yeah. Gord? Thank you for the good work that you, you're doing, the teachers, the principals. I understand this is a tough subject. I'm glad you came in today. Um, the last thing I'll say is that this is not just the children that, that happen. This is happening through uh, uh, the families. And I, do, I don't know if there's a mech mechanism that we can bring families in to talk about this. Um, at the same time, uh, it's something that you, you might want to explore. It might be reaching out of your, your, your boundaries and stuff. But I think conversations need to happen. And I think that's that would be my last thing I say about that. Yeah. Tamara? Um, I will say that the work that uh, the diversity consultant is doing with the community engagement really is to um, provide that safe conversation point to talk about what are the things in which we can do to make, a, make an impact um, for your experience as a parent and your children within our school system. And it's through that trusting relationship um, that we really are taking advantage of that. And, and I, I think it's, it's so incredibly important um, to recognize that we need to have that voice and provide opportunities and safe places for parents to discuss and share that um, because they're incredibly um, personal stories and very, very difficult stories to talk about and um, having somebody with a lived experience to share those with, I'm, I'm hoping that it would be a catalyst um, for, for us to identify those, the ways in which um, families and children will be able to um, help us do better. Thank you. So 
Oh, yeah, sorry, Lynn, go ahead. Thank you, Chair. I'm just going to jump back off something you had said to Mary. You had indicated there is funding provided for community yes. groups. Would you mind forwarding some of that information on to the Chair? I, I will. Um, so I think it's available through um, the, the budget, um, but I will um, bring that back to, to the Chair. Thank you. Thank you. If there are no other quick questions, um, I do have just one little teeny question. Um, so going back to uh, what Sonny had talked about on December 20th, so that presentation will be for all. And then maybe just tell me, after that presentation, did you say that there's something for the students after from this? Is that right, Sorry. That would be next steps. That would be the next steps, okay. Yes. And so after that, I'm assuming that there would be something that would be possibly even sent home with students for parents as well? There, or is that something that you're looking at? There's two pieces. There would be the community engagement um, to make sure that community members understand the guidelines, and there would be student engagement to make sure that the students understand the guidelines. Okay, perfect. No, that's all I want to know. So I do thank you both. Thank you all for coming in. Really appreciate it. Uh, we're going to take just a very short break because we do have some other presenters coming in. So again, thank you very much, and uh, we'll just take a very short break. Mm -hmm. That was great.
to speak, just raise your hand. We're back, uh, the Standing Committee on Education and Economic Growth. Uh, now we're going to uh, receive a briefing on a report conducted on incidents of bullying at East Wilshire uh, Intermediate School, Public Schools Branch. Um, we will have you both introduce yourself and then we'll start. Sure. Norbert Carpenter, Director, Public Schools Branch. Thank you, Norbert. And Terry? Terry McAdam, Director of Student Services, Public Schools Branch. All right, perfect. So we'll uh, follow the same format um, presentation, and then we will uh, go into questions. And I believe you have something that has been handed out, uh, Norbert. Yes, I do. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, everyone, for your invitation and the continued interest in public education. Um, I do have some notes here. I think you had a handout. It's a, just a brief timeline of events because we're going back to June of last year uh, about an incident that uh, spanned over a couple of weeks at East Wilshire Intermediate School in Cornwall. Um, I'm cognizant that I don't want to read to you, but I will highlight some of these notes on here, and uh, then Terry and I will have, uh, we'll open up the floor for questions. Um, so in the week of June 7th to the 11th was Spirit Week at East Wilshire Intermediate School, and that was organized by the Student Council. Um, and the var various events took place throughout that week, um, with Pride Day being celebrated on June 10th. And late in the day on June 11th, some questions surfaced uh, around events um, related to student misconduct during uh, the Pride celebrations on the previous day, which was June 10th. Uh, the public schools branch contacted the school principal for an update. So into June 11th and 12th, lots of chatter on various social media platforms alleging misconduct of students and staff at East Wilshire School. Uh, moving to June 13th, various connections with school administration um, by ourselves at the public schools branch. Uh, meeting was held on Sunday evening to plan uh, to support. Uh, there was a plan for support for the students and staff on the 14th. Uh, RCMP were notified because through social media channels there was lots of uh, banter going back and forth um, about what could actually take place on Monday morning. Um, there was a demonstration on Monday the 14th. It was peaceful. Um, the school, it was held outside the school in support of the 2SLGBTQIA plus community. Meeting with staff and public schools branch personnel prior to classes beginning, because there was a lot of angst in the building, a lot of unknowns, a lot of questions. Uh, many uh, of our staff remained on the site for the day, as um, was diversity and inclusion consultant, Evelyn. Bradley, we invited her to come along for the day as well, and we did have a staff debrief at the end of the day. Then moving uh, to the next week, June 15th and 20th, uh, lots of assertions of wrongdoing by staff continue to circulate in social media. It was determined that Evelyn Bradley would be asked to conduct a review investigation uh, of the events that transpired the week previous. Rumors of additional protests at the school circulated. Uh, the public schools branch received a number of emails about uh, about allegations. Uh, the public schools branch contacted some parents directly, uh, that would be myself, to encourage them to take the conversations offline and to have uh, conversations with myself or RCMP or whomever. Um, 
and the RCB were also contacted regarding the possibility of further demonstrations. And on June 15th, Evelyn Bradley commenced her investigation at the school. Uh, as you know, the report was made public on August 12th. Um, <coughs> and just since then, there's been collaboration uh, continued between partners such as Pri PEI and Peers Alliance. And the Public Schools Branch Student Services Division, led by Terry, have a pilot program, as you know, have a, uh, to support diversity, equity, inclusion. Uh, that work has already commenced. And we'll have Terry just give a little bit of an update when the questions come in about what's going on. Um, that, that gives you a little bit of a snapshot of the events that transpired at East Wilshire. Um, you know, sitting here today, December, um, you know, almost six months removed from the incidents. Uh, very unsettling uh, set of events, uh, regretful situation. And, you know, firstly, for any students that were victimized um, during those times, you know, our, our, our hearts and our thoughts have been with them. Um, this has been top of mind uh, for my office and Terry's office. Um, but I, I also want to say for the staff, um, the staff at that school um, endured a lot of hardships, many of which were unfounded, uh, where, where people were making allegations online that all staff and the entire staff was homophobic and transphobic. And we know that's not true. Um, so the vitriol that happened online was, was quite damaging. And um, I have to say, I met with staff in July, in the summertime, and those emotions were still raw. Um, um, you know, that staff did act professionally, and, um, and that's not dismissing uh, what happened, because there were wrongdoings at the school. Um, some students were disciplined because of those wrongdoings, um, but we are dealing with teenage children, uh, young teenage children. Um, so there is a community piece, there's a parent piece, there's an education piece, um, and um, the comments in the previous session are not lost on me about reporting. Um, that's actually been the number one thing, um, as Mr. McNeely said, that um, I know I feel needs to be addressed. Uh, because on the heels of this event, you go to Charlottetown Rural, you have another major issue pop up, um, and it, it shows us, tells us, the reporting mechanisms are not strong enough. Um, and we have taken some, some actions. Uh, you know, getting the voices of students is really important, as uh, Terry has mentioned. And uh, I think uh, Ms. Altus asked about the Child Youth Advocate. Um, we did have a scheduled meeting today, um, and that had to be moved, um, but we do have one on uh, January 10th, and it is solely about the reporting mechanisms. Um, and I have reached out some counterparts um, in school boards in Nova Scotia uh, about this very issue and having at least engaged in, in conversation about some of the things that we can do together to address these problems. But um, I know this is uh, specific to East Wilshire Intermediate School, so uh, any questions? available. Uh, I will ask Terry maybe to ask, answer some of the questions that are on the ground um, that are happening today. But All right. Is there anything that you wanted to add, Terry, or do you want to open the floor up to questions? I think I'll open up to questions because I think I did address quite a bit of what we're doing in the last session, but if there are other questions in addition to that. Okay. Uh, we'll start with Mark. Okay. So first of all, uh, <laughs> I have three daughters that, that have attended uh, EWS and actually one that's still there. So first of all, you know, we've always been impressed by that school. I, I want to uh, be very strong about the staff there and, and even the Bluefield family schools. They're fantastic. We've always been, been very happy of those. I, I think after reading the report, obviously it's very close to home. You know, I hope everyone would resist the temptation to pile on on these types of situations. I think we need to tread slowly and carefully, but uh, obviously, um, we live in that social digital world. Um, so again, uh, schools aren't Im immune to the challenges that we see in society. Um, and then again, back to teachers, they, they are one of the most challenging positions that you could probably have. And I think it's actually getting even more challenging in, in this realm. Um, with that being said, I, I just, I'd like to read um, the findings, just a, a little excerpt from, from the report, because I, I would encourage everyone, especially the parents of children attending East Wilshire, to read the report that is online and was released. It's, it's available for public viewing. 
And as Norbert said, I don't want to diminish what happened there, but I think there's some important takeaways from the report that would you know, guide parents, students, teachers, and PSB going forward. Um, we all agree that training and diversity training you know, is, is, is important, and, and we're gonna, we will you know, start to do that and, and move forward. So I just want to read, uh, just for the record, um, from section 5.1, which is called the findings. The evidence does not support the accusations alluding to child neglect and endangerment on the part of staff, nor do student accounts corroborate that the culture and climate at East Wilshire supports or condones bullying due to 2SLGBTQ plus identities. The evidence does show bullying of minority students does take place. However, it does not show a correlation between student behaviors and, st and staff approval of said behaviors. Staff reported all accounts to the appropriate administrators and ensured student safety throughout that day. Staff maintained a level of professionalism that is required and substantial evidence to suggest that they did not was never uncovered. So as a parent of a student attending EWS, I appreciated reading the report and the details that it contained. Um, again, it's not a dismissive comment, but um, it made me feel better as a parent of that child, uh, you know, of, of, a, of a child that attends that school that, you know, that the staff did, you know, under the current framework, all that they, they could. So I just, I just want to enter that into the record that that I appreciate the staff that what they did there, and, and again, is there work to do? Absolutely, but we'll, 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 that's what we're here for today to talk about. That. So you don't have any questions? I just want to make that statement, okay. Zach. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I think I'll leave that alone. I would love to know uh, when the report came out. There were a number of recommendations, and could we start off by getting an overview of which ones have been implemented currently? T Terry? <clears throat> Sorry, I didn't have the report in front of me. Nope. So, so the first one, the forging the partnerships with organizations and condensing resources and information. So that's the work that's currently being done by Beyond the Brim. Um, and the, D the rubric for responding to um, Sorry, for to our progressive discipline model, that's be, that is being developed, and the PD is also being provided by Beyond the Brim. So they're doing some after-school training, some additional training with the staff who have volunteered to be their their school champions. Um, the training opportunities for staff. Um, to encourage a baseline for future dialogue. So the 20th of December will be the first day for staff across the island, um, in addition to staff at East Wilshire who are receiving training. Um, so that's all around the training, I think. The development of a roundtable made up of staff, parents, and students, that's, that's been addressed. And the progressive discipline matrix, sorry, I thought that's what the other one was. And the diversity champions. So those have been those have been addressed as well. Uh, Norbert, I, I would just want to add too. So we have met with Peers Alliance um, and Pride PI a, a few times since, um, and uh, I feel that relationship is strengthened uh, over the last few months. And we also uh, have been uh, at the table with the minister, the deputy, to talk about the need uh, for days like December twentieth and also for um, dedication and resources uh, that we can do. And this, is it all from East Wilshire? Maybe not, but that, that's at the forefront because that was a huge incident within our school system last year. So, um, and I would applaud them for adding uh, Debbie Langston as a consultant that that only happened um, in the summer of last year, so. Lynn? I think it's important to note that regardless of the fact that of the findings that Mark read for us, there were two SLGBTQIA plus kids in that school who did not feel safe. And that would be a very little comfort to me if that was one of my children who were in that community. I know that the teachers spoke at great length of feeling like they did not have the tools that they needed to address that. 
And that's an awful feeling for a teacher. There's no question about that. I did not see the same vitriol online that you're obviously speaking of. I definitely saw a lot of messaging around uh, teachers failing to intervene, but not around teachers having uh, caused direct harm, like seems to be implied here. But I definitely heard from a lot of teachers who felt they did not have what they needed to successfully navigate, and that would be awful for that teacher. What sorts of on-the-ground resources will exist for people going forward so that teachers are not left in that situation? Norbert? Yeah, a couple points. Um, so, right, social media is, is quite a spectrum. So there's lots of, lots of comments on there that were probably appropriate. Um, and lots of parents, public forum, they, get, they ask questions, they had concerns, no issue with that. There were some that uh, crossed the line and addressed individuals, named individuals, called out individuals, made allegations against individuals. Um, so, you know, they are in a different category, um, obviously. Um, I think the work, and as it was pointed out earlier, um, Evelyn Bradley and her company, uh, Beyond the Brim, is only one, is only one quiver uh, or, or one arrow in our quiver. We know we know that. Um, however, it's giving us some baseline information that we need to have to be able to say what else does that school and every school need. Um, we're living in uncertain and challenging times. Um, you know, society seems to be being pulled apart at times here. Um, so we need something. And I know for some it might sound sound like too little, too late. But we do have to have a starting point. These issues came to our doorstep, and we, I would like to say, have listened and addressed and tried to do our best within our means uh, to put some things in place. So uh, I do think um, Evelyn's work at the five pilots will help us. Um, it may reveal that we have a long, long way to go, um, but at least it gives us some baseline information so that we can go uh, and say you know, to the government of the day, uh, we need more resources as a public education system to be able to address these issues. Lynn? Thank you, Chair. And I appreciate that answer, Norbert. I, I believe one of the recommendations was that there should be up to 60 hours of professional development training <coughs> for teachers. And I note there was none leading up to uh, Pride Week or Spirit Week um, last time. How will that be different this year, uh, next year, excuse me, 2022? Terry? So the teachers have started receiving those 60 hours, um, and they will be receiving more on December the 20th, as all teachers will, but they've been receiving it from beyond the brim. Um, Peers Alliance has been in to do a presentation at their school as recently as probably two weeks ago. So they are, they are receiving that education at this moment, yes. Lynn? Thank you, Chair. I'm curious, I, I think the report that came out of East Wilshire was really important. And I'm curious if a similar report will happen as a result of the rural walkout that happened later in the year. Right, so Norbert? It's a little, it's a different issue, obviously. Um, there's been a lot of work um, happening behind the scenes to support the students at the rural and, and, and dig into what actually happened and what can we improve there. Um, there's no plan at this point for a third level, or sorry, a third party um, review. Um, similar to what happened at East Wilshire. Lynn, one more and then I'm going to move along. Fair enough, it's a follow-up. Just curious, why not? Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's not like it hasn't been discussed. There's not like there's some measures in place. Um, so we, we are working with the school staff right now um, to determine what can be improved. Um, we do have uh, a person that's working with the school who is a third party. Um, however, it, it's not of, of the same um, it's not the same, obviously, it's not the same issue, so we're looking at what we can do to help staff, because very similar to the point that came out of the East Wilshire one, uh, we're hearing comments that school staff didn't feel equipped, right, didn't feel equipped um, to deal with some of these issues. Um, um, that, was, that was a very, you know, troubling situation when you have 300 female students, um, you know, come out and say they don't feel safe. Um, that's huge. Um, so we, we need to know um, what's happening. And, and Terry's team has been very involved on the ground at, at Charlottetown Rural. Um, but again, it's not just a Charlottetown Rural thing either. 
Um, so uh, we're learning from that situation. Um, and uh, so to answer the question, there's not the same third party investigation happening, uh, but there is some work of a third party at that school. Trish? Thank you, Chair. Um, so uh, you mentioned that uh, the work of uh, um, diversity, having diversity champions in each school, that that's already underway. Um, so um, is that in every school or just in the five pilot schools? That's Gary? in the five pilot schools currently. Oh. Trish? Uh, thank you, Chair. So there is, so is there, are there plans to, um, to start implementing uh, diversity champions across all of the schools uh, to start that training with, with more teachers? Terry? That would definitely be our plan. We're going to look at how, how it goes this year and collect some data and have some feedback from the schools on how that position worked, how that role worked within the school, and, and build from where we are this year. Trish? And you mentioned that most of the schools have GSAs currently. Um, do you know how many schools don't? I don't have that information. I know many do, but I don't have the information on how many do or don't. It's something we can find out, but it's really run at a school level. It's not run at a student services level. Mm -hmm. I just know from having been in schools and had those conversations that many do have a GSA. Trish? Yeah, and thank you, Chair. And and in your consultation, you know, with students and reaching out to hear the voice of students uh, on on these issues, uh, do you reach out to GSAs, uh, students who have identified, you know, with that group, um, and uh, you know, that might be an opportunity to connect specifically with students who, um, you know, ha might be directly impacted. That would be work that our consultants would do. Okay. So we have counseling consultants in all of the, who are assigned to all of our schools, and many of them would have work with the GSAs, yes. Trish? Okay, so in, in developing policies and plans moving forward to address issues uh, um, around uh, discrimination and harassment in relation to, uh, to gender identity um, and sexuality, um, you know, there wouldn't be discussion directly with, with the GSA groups? Um, if we were doing a policy, yes, they'd okay. be one of the stakeholders who would be able to give consultation on that policy. Okay. We're going to go one more and then yeah. I'll be on the bottom. Thank you, Chair. And I guess it does come back to this point of, you know, that we have, you know, gender and diversity guidelines, but not a policy. And I know that this has been asked already, but it's certainly something that I've, you know, we've heard again and again as a committee, um, you know, that the fact that there isn't a policy, that there's, you know, that really... Um, takes away some of the ability to uh, ensure that the what's outlined in those guidelines is actually being followed. You know, so you know, I mean, is that part of the uh, you know the plans moving forward to develop a policy so that there is you know some stronger um, you know uh, ability to 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 act on this? Yeah. So Sorry. the guidelines are being released from the Department of Education and Lifelong Learning. They're not being released from the PSB, though we did have a lot of input into the development of them. But again, I go back to the fact that they're all based on human rights. So there, there is some teeth to it that they have to be followed because they are human rights. Um, and, and you have to adhere to human rights in any organization. Do you have a follow up? Yeah. That? Yeah. So, okay. I appreciate that. Absolutely. So practically speaking, though, if there's a, a situation in a school, um, you know, if, if a student feels unsafe or that something um, that they feel harassed, so their path is to, you know, in the direction of human rights, um, they, they have to, like, or do they have a path through the school? Like, I just, I feel like that's a, a bit, um, it would be difficult for a student to actually be able to, uh, achieve that or you know yeah sorry I'm not wording that I, I know it's not like a direct yeah. path to they don't have to go to human rights to do their reporting if yes. that's what you're asking yes that's what I'm and that's we're working on that reporting mechanism so under our our current reporting mechanism you know you go to your teacher you go to your principal then the principal tries to deal with it at the school level and then they might come to student services and we would become involved so it would be no different with if it if it's any issue within a school it could still fall, flow that way but sometimes I might go out and say well under the Education Act you, you do have to do this or under the Human Rights Act you do have to do this or under the Child Protection Act you do have to do this so there are acts that we refer to all the time when we're working with with schools on um, what the rights of that child might be 
So that's what I meant by they're protected under the Human Rights Act, just like other things would be protected under the Education Act or the Child um, Protection Act. So I'm not sure if maybe I didn't explain myself well yeah. enough. But no, they don't have to go to Human Rights and file a complaint. I'm going to come back to you, okay? Can I just say one more, just one yeah. quick follow-up on yeah, that, and then you can fine. move on? Yeah. So, okay, so I guess, you know, as, a, as I'm, I'm, I'm listening to this, and I, I agree, these, you know, certainly there, these are, you know, rights that are protected under the Human Rights Act in many cases, um, but to me that sort of, it should be the, the, this should be flipped around, that because there are protections under the Human Rights Act, this should be in policy in schools, not, not the other way around, that it's not necessary to be in policy because it's already enshrined in the Human Rights Act. Um, so, you know, I, I guess I just don't understand the logic there. Um, to me, that would make an even stronger case for why it does need to be a, a policy within schools. So, that's... Norbert? In there. So, I think, to be clear, it, there are guidelines right now, and as Terry just mentioned, um, they're, they reside with the Department of Education Lifelong Learning at this point. We had substantial input. Um, and student services before they were developed into guidelines, which it was only in the last uh, number of months, um, we were using the Alberta guidelines. Um, and there were guidelines themselves from the province of Alberta. So I think we have to remember, it's not like these may remain guidelines forever. I think this is a starting point to get these guidelines down. Um, there has been uh, an overwhelming, my understanding, amount of feedback from the public during the consultation process. Um, and I think they're sifting through all that consultation. So I think, you know, at some point, maybe this evolves into a policy. Absolutely. I don't think that's ever been off the table. I can come back to you. Sonny? Thanks. Thank you very much for coming in and sharing this information with us. I just have a couple of questions. One was uh, the child advocate, youth and, and uh, child advocate, like, my understanding, he wasn't involved in any of the investigation. Is there a reason why, and has he been brought up to speed on what has happened? So you, Norbert? You're speaking, Sonny, to the East Wilshire incident? Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. He, he's been brought up to speed. The office has been informed. Um, I, I feel like there were gaps, maybe, in what he would, that office would consider consultation. Um, I, we've had, uh, I wouldn't want to quantify, but a few meetings since where we've talked about that quite openly, about how uh, their interpretation and maybe our understanding uh, and our interpretation was different. Um, however, we've uh, reached a point now where we feel we're on the same page in terms of what consultation actually means. Um, that's from the public schools branch perspective. Um, so I, I feel um, things are moving in the right direction and I would use uh, the reporting mechanism as a, an example that we can say, We've reached out, we've set up meetings, uh, we're asking for their input. So. Sonny? Thank you. I just wanted to question. In your report, there's a talk about progressive discipline. Could, just for the record, could you give us a little explanation to that? Yeah. Terry? I, I may have used the same example when I spoke to this before, and I'm, I'm not sure if it was here or not. But So for an example of a progressive discipline, if a student gets caught smoking out in the parking lot, Right? We're not going to say to that school, I'm going to use my five days that I'm allowed to suspend you for um, on, a, on a first incident. So progressively, you would work with that student. So the first time, you might have them meet with a youth service worker and talk about you know, why smoking isn't healthy and why you shouldn't engage in that practice and have a conversation with their family about you know, what happened. And, but the next day, they go out and do it again. Um, you're going to take it even a little bit more seriously and say, we're going to have to add on to what we did yesterday. Something more has to happen because we didn't get our message across. And you progress with your discipline so that what you're not doing is just jumping to a, a three-day suspension or a five-day suspension for a student who has you know, broken a school rule. You try and work with that student and do some education with that school. Sometimes we might do a peer mediation, for example. So two students have had a conflict. We might bring them in with a mediator and do some peer mediation rather than just you go home. Um, we try and make those students work it out together and, and understand what kind of an effect it might have had on the other person, what they've done. So that's sort of how progressive discipline works. And we use it with staff and students. Sonny? And could you 
You tell me, uh, do you have good results with that method? For Terry? Versus sending them home the first time? Terry? I think we do. I think there are sometimes there's people who would like to say, you should have just sent them home. And for some situations, you do. If there's an unsafe situation created, then obviously you have to make it safe. Or if there's been threatening behavior, then we would send that student home and do a threat assessment, and we would have a plan in place to support them on their return and make sure that everybody's safe. That would be so. There are situations where you have to look at it and say, no, no, this is an unsafe situation. But where is a situation of, and, and I'm using the term literally, of ignorance? Um, of not knowing that that could be harmful or that that could be harmful to myself or could be harmful to someone else, and I don't mean in a safety way, then you want to educate that student as well as you can on, you know, why smoking is bad for you and what can we do to support you to not smoke and why we don't allow smoking on our school property because the younger children will see that and that's not the kind of education we want for them. So you do need to kind of work with someone from where they are and do a, do some education on on the incident. And yeah, we are we are seeing some good results with it, but I don't want you to think that safety is in question there because if it's an unsafe situation, then right away we have to we have to react. Gord? Yeah, and it's it's interesting because looking back, we were supposed to have have you in and then there was a huge meeting we couldn't couldn't get you in so I guess some time has passed I uh, just want to make sure I'm just checking in to see how the students are doing and how the staff are doing because they, they everybody in that school went through a lot yeah. Yeah. Terry so from my perspective uh, my work is to work with students and in, in all of the situations like at rural and at East Wilshire my responsibility is around students so we did we had a presence in that school most of, well, I'd say all of that week, we had counselors available in the school for the students. And some students didn't come forward and speak with us. And we have, um, our counseling consultant has been there quite a bit this fall, just checking in. One of their school counselors retired, so that was, you know, the timing of that. We wanted to make sure that the new counselor was up to speed and was able to support those students. So we have put a little bit extra work in there this year. I can't say definitively that everyone's doing well because you don't always know that. Um, but we have tried to open up avenues, um, especially with um, peers being present in the school and doing some presentations in the school. Yeah. As for the staff, Norbert can yeah, speak and, to Norbert. And, and the staff, um, I know I met with several staff in July, and uh, I'm still very disillusioned about the whole uh, the whole event and what came after, um, and to. Uh, Ms. Lund's point, um, you know, not feeling equipped didn't help, uh, and we own that as an organization. Um, if, they, if they're not equipped to deal with the issues, and, you know, when people made broad sweeping uh, assertions about what they did wrong, um, I strongly feel everyone did the best they could with the knowledge they had, and, you know, being someone that's worked in the trenches in education for years you know i know their hearts are in the right place and they were doing the best they could but um it's our job and the department of education's job to work on how to improve um so when these events surface they're better equipped so i think that's the message from staff and uh, i'm hoping um, they're feeling better about some of the initiatives we've rolled out since gord yeah and then looking back and review was there was there signs leading up to this incident or was it just like how did it happen so fast and you know um did you looking back over the last six months was was there some something there that we missed as a society <laughs> i think that's a Terry? question we ask ourselves a lot too did we miss something here but i had been in the school on friday of that week um on another situation and i would say that it was very calm there was no outward appearance of anything being wrong in the school on that particular day for the couple of hours that I was in the building. Um, students who came forward, and I met with quite a few of them, and we always partnered, so there were two of us when we met with the students to make sure someone was note-taking and someone was listening and being an active listener. It's hard to be an active listener when you're note-taking, um, so we always had two of us there. A lot of the things that they brought forward were not as serious as what we read 
on Facebook. That's not to take away from what the students were saying because they felt what they felt. Um, but none of those students who came to me talked about their teachers not being supportive. And as a matter of fact, each of the students that came to me said that they felt they had someone they could talk to within the building. So I would not have said that I saw anything before that, but I'm not in the school every day either. I don't know if the staff would have said anything to Norbert, but from the students that I met with, I did not get that impression that they had expected something to happen. Norbert? I guess I would say to, um like from a whole bunch of different perspectives as a dad, as an educator, as someone that has loved ones that belong, you know, to the 2SLGBTQ community. Um, some of the comments were quite hurtful from, you know, the public and during the consultation process for the, the guidelines as well. Um, it's, um, it's difficult to comprehend that, you know, the attitudes of some um, are, are very, you know, they're just so wrong and so hurtful. Um, and, you know, as, as education, we're a huge piece of this. We have an opportunity to help, um, but we, we simply can't do it alone either. Um, you know, there's communities that need to be wrapped around. And, and I think we have, we have an advantage because we have that platform to educate. But um, that, that in itself, I think, was, was really uh, eye-opening to myself and our whole team that... A lot of hatred, a lot of transphobia, homophobia out there in our community. Gord? Yeah, and, and just when I was looking at that, and I keep thinking about it because it's just happened, is that I'm worried about the cyber stuff. I'm worried about Snapchat. I'm worried about TikTok. I'm worried about these things where kids can do things and maybe react, and they get, that, that, that to me is like, that's why I kind of asked the question, because on the outside, Everything looks normal, but on the inside, we don't we don't know. Parents don't know. Teachers don't know uh, about the communication, and um, you know that that's become. And I know we've talked about this before, and and I think it was Lynn that, that mentioned it too. But that's 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 concerning, and I'm, I'm worried about that. And the other thing I wanted to ask the the the, the question was about what's happening uh, related to the section on immaterial evidence. I think we talked about it a little bit in that report. There's four different things. There's four specific things in there that we talk about. I think it's uh, uh, COVID. Um, okay, so it's it's um, the four different things are uh, four t key target areas were used to categorize the immaterial uh, information: curriculum, COVID, school climate and culture, and equity disparities. Um, that was noted in that report. Um, so there's. There's those four things, okay. and that was under immaterial evidence yep. on key target areas. Just a, maybe a couple minutes on those, sorry. Terry? Did you, did yeah. you ask a question? Oh, that's, <laughs> yes, I did. I just, I did. I'm glad that uh, uh, you were. Um, so the, under in, in, in 3.0, um, under that section, there's mm -hmm. uh, four key uh, target areas were used. And I'm glad these were in the report, too, as well. Um, so uh, looked at they need to look at curriculum, uh, COVID-19, climate and culture, and equity and, di and equity disparities. So I think we talked about a little bit out in the first presentation, but if we missed anything, maybe you could um, elaborate a little bit. Yep, sure. uh, Terry? Um, curriculum, of course, would be Tammy, so I can't, I'm not going to comment on curriculum. COVID-19, um, as it relates to any curriculum, it's, it's been difficult. Um, there were things that didn't move forward because of COVID, and that was around the teaching of, and again, that, that is Tammy's area, but I know that there were some units that maybe didn't get taught in the health curriculum because of the COVID and people not maybe not being able to be trained. I'm not really sure. You can invite Tammy back to the floor if you want more information of that. Um, but certainly I will say that COVID itself has had a huge impact on the mental health. And we've been very, very lucky here on Prince Edward Island. We've lived a next to normal life, but it still has had a huge impact on the mental health of children and on the mental health of their families. Um, situations like these are blowing up on social media, and I would say part of it is because of the mental health of the people that are involved. It's, it's, it's definitely out there, but as far as that curriculum piece, I'm not sure. 
School culture and climate is, you know, definitely they had a Gay Straight Alliance group at their school, and I think maybe they didn't have it the previous year because of the COVID and extra visitors in the school, but it is up and running again, and Peers Alliance is in the school quite regularly, like I said, doing presentations. Peers um, sat right directly on our committee to form our training for December 20th. So we've, we've developed a really good working relationship with them that I think is helping a lot. And the equity disparities definitely, definitely exist at that school and at other schools. And I mean, we are trying to help our teachers through some education on how to respond. Because again, when I did the presentation on microaggressions, so many people responded to me afterwards, I didn't really understand. You know, when a student would come to me and say, so-and-so said this to me, they'd be like, okay. But they didn't understand. And the actual video that I use is, it, it talks about it being like, if you get one mosquito bite, that's one thing. But when you're constantly getting mosquito bites, it becomes something different. And so for people to understand that through the presentations we've been doing for them, I think really opened their eyes to microaggressions, and we do actually have that in our December 20th training as well, um, to understand, to try and put yourself in somebody else's shoes. So we are working on that education piece with our teachers, um, but it, you're, you're right, it definitely exists. Gord? Yeah, and I just want to say good luck with the December 20th training. I hope I hope there's some something on there where they have to answer a few questions at the end to make sure they're they're listening all day. December 20th this is a tough day to, to get everybody's attention, but I think it's an important one, and, and thanks a lot for coming in today. Yeah, thank you. We're very excited about it. Thank you, Gord. Lynn? Thank you, Chair. I want to jump off uh, something Gord said, actually, a little bit. I know we're a few months into this school year, and you've indicated that Piers is in school really regularly, and I'm just curious if you have gotten feedback from either the students or from Piers Alliance on how the students are feeling about that community culture, that school culture, versus last year. Are Terry? you hearing oh, improvements sorry. or about the same? I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if you have any nuance in that. And Terry? again, it's hard to draw a, a comparison because really we didn't know where things were before. Um, but peers, they've been working with us on this presentation, so we've been meeting quite regularly, and they would just say that they're being well received in all of the schools that they're going into, that they are getting contacted. Um, they are being contacted by teachers. They are seeing students when they're in the buildings. So that in itself, to me, is more positive than where we would have said we were maybe a year ago. Lynn? Thank you, Chair. Fair enough. I, I suppose that doesn't give me a sense of whether or not you're hearing from students directly on this, but perhaps there isn't a clear mechanism for students to let you know how that situation is shaping up. Is that yeah. probably a fair statement? Right. And they would go probably to their school counselor or to a counseling consultant when they're in the building. But I haven't had the concern brought to me from that level to say students are feeling this way or that way. Um, there will be follow-up as we go through this program because they, East Wilshire is one of our pilot schools. So as we are evaluating, and I will show you the evaluation framework, then you'll we'll have a, a good idea of how well things are working. Lynn? Thank you, Chair. So the, the hope eventually, of course, is that that information does get reported up so that what is happening at the school does get to PSB, does get to the minister, if you will. That's what we're working towards. Yep. Sure. So thank you. Just one other question, Chair. I'm curious, when students come forward and express a concern, does PSB routinely tell them that they have the right to contact the Child and Youth Advocate? And again, a lot of those concerns are expressed right at the school level. I know I've referred a lot of people to the Child and Youth Advocate, like a lot of families that come to me with a concern that say, did you know that your child can you know, access the Child and Youth Advocate? We have brochures in many of our schools, and we've invited the Child and Youth Advocate to put those brochures out in prominent places in schools so that children do know about them. And our school counselors, I had um, Rachel Horn from the uh, uh, Child and Youth Advocate office in to present to all of my student services team to make them aware of what the services are that are offered so that as consultants they would know when they're working with families that this is an avenue that you can go. 
You have one follow-up? If I may. Yep. Thank you, Chair. Just sort of expanding off of that, I almost think it's so important, almost more important, at that first incident that they have access to the Child and Youth Advocate instead of waiting until it's gotten to a point where the family is involved and there is a whole wraparound of supports for them. I wonder if it couldn't be part of a regular process that when someone comes forward and says they've experienced what feels to them like harassment, discrimination, um, any of those types of things that they immediately are aware that that's a pathway for them. And it's also good for us to collect that data in a centralized place. Any thoughts on that, Norbert? Yeah. Norbert? Yeah, so I think, as I said earlier, we are meeting with the Child and Youth Advocate coming up in the next couple of weeks, and uh, it is a bit reporting. Um, and I, that will be a topic that we'll discuss. Um, I will say um, they are a new group, too, and we're, we're just learning uh, their work, the scope of their work, and their, their mandate. Um, so together, I think uh, we're getting to a point where it's a more collaborative relationship. Uh, and I know that will be raised uh, by the Child and Youth Advocate, and uh, you bring it to our attention today um, is helpful because it, it's an important thing that we'll bring to the table as well. So. I'm good. Thank Thanks. you, Chair. Trish? Thank you, Chair. Just, um, just one more, I guess, you know, question, and just sort of as, a, as we're listening to the discussion here today, just a, a few thoughts. So, you know, Gord had, had mentioned, uh, you know, did we miss something as, as a society? And I think that's a really interesting question. I think it's an important one. Um, I think perhaps an, a, the more important question, I think, would be, you know, what are we still missing? Right. So, so this was one incident, you know, an incident that happened on one specific day where we had, you know, two, I believe it was two uh, students initially come forward um, and, and we got to hear that, uh, that they were uh, had, having their, the experience that they had, but how many students are, are we not hearing from, right? We've spoken a lot about, you know, what was posted on social media about this and was that true, was it not? And, you know, the, the purpose to me of, of uh, the, the report and looking into the incident wasn't to validate or not random things that were said on social media. It's, it's about, you know, what's actually happening in the schools um, and, and, you know, what can we do to ensure that all students uh, feel safe and are valued and, and able to, to feel they can be themselves in, in schools, right? So I guess, you know, moving forward, I just, I want to make sure that we're not, um, it, it's important to acknowledge that there, there are things being said on social media, certainly. Um, and I, I take Gord's point that in terms of the experience of, our, of children and youth engaging in social media and Snapchat and what might, that's important. But that's not, that didn't have, that's not the incident that happened at East Wilshire. It wasn't an online incident. It was an in-person incident, right? So um, I just, I don't want us to lose track of, you know, what, what, the, what the real focus needs to be. And that's on the experience of the students, you know, in, in the schools and making sure that we're not losing those, those voices. Um, so yeah, that question, I hope that it guides the rest of the work moving forward. What are, what are we still missing? Because if we're hearing from yeah, a, a few students, uh, there's certainly many more who we're not hearing from and making sure that they know that they can go to the child advocate's office to, to share their experiences uh, and, and their concerns. And that it's made clear what the paths are in the school, right? Um, you know, who they can talk to. I think that those diversity champions, honestly, I, I'm not sure we need to, to be waiting on that. Um, you know, that was a recommendation in the report. Um, it's an opportunity to make sure that all students know, like, who, who are the, the people in the school that, you know, they can talk to about um, issues around gender diversity and sexuality and, and harassment and discrimination around these issues. They're very serious. And so, you know, um, I guess, you know, I, I guess I don't really have a question, but I think it's good that there's, there are pilots happening, but I don't want all the other schools to have to wait, you know, for, for these, some of these things to move forward, because there are students now in schools across the island, you know, who, who are perhaps not feeling safe or not feeling that they are able to be themselves. And yeah, I just, I wish I would, I would like to be hearing more about what's happening across all schools immediately to let students know who they can talk to and, and how to express and uh, those experiences. Uh, Norbert? Um, I actually really value what you've just said, and I, I see a lot of mirror, especially in the, in the front part of your statement. Um, I mean, yes, we get swallowed up in social media, and as you said, really wasn't the intent, but, but uh, I think it's, it's worth noting that there is collateral damage when that stuff happens, and, and professionals that go to work every day who are diversity champions, 
who were, you know, feeding kids, you know, giving kids uh, clothing and all this, like, they feel, you know, this big at the end of the day because they were giving their heart and soul above and beyond the call of duty every day. So that, that's been a bit of a bone of a contention with, with myself and with some of the leaders. And that's not saying that there's not issues in schools because we know there are. So that that's, if you're getting feedback from us that's, you know, we're trying to push that aside, we're not. Your point's clear and, and well taken because it is about the students in the building. Um, but I guess sometimes we just don't highlight all the good work that our staffs are doing. And we've seen that play out at East Belshire. We've seen it play out Charlottetown Rural, where people, you know, were really disillusioned because they know they're doing all those things, but we only hear about the negativity, right? So, um, but right back to your first point, it is about those students and how they feel comfortable in our buildings. Um, and I, I think there's a lot of work to do, or I really do. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's, uh, we have finite resources and uh, I think um, when we sit around the table at leadership, that's what we're talking about. How can we do more? How can we improve the reporting process? How do we hear the voices of the voices we're not being, are not being heard, right? Um, and um, we always welcome feedback. Um, and I like to say we're a collaborative organization and um, if, if there are things out there that people think we need to be doing and considering, we're open to it. You have a follow-up? Thank you, Norbert. Yeah, just a quick follow-up. I really do appreciate that. Um, I think um, the question of how do we support teachers in the social mm -hmm. media age in general yes. is a very valuable one. It's it To me, it's it's a separate one, from, mm -hmm. or at least mostly separate from this particular issue. It's, it is. a, it's yeah. an issue in and of itself that you know can be looked at and addressed and, and what can be done to support teachers in that way. But I don't want it to get overshadow right. I know. You know, yeah. what the real issue is in, that we're talking about here today and, and trying to address. So, yeah. Mark? I just kind of have a kind of a practical question, I guess. I mean, I'm no expert. I don't claim to be one, but after reading some of this stuff and, and understanding what a GSA is, I, I, I just feel that it's, you know, access to resource. It creates a link between the school and, and the students and so on and so forth. So how are they formed at schools? How, how does some have them and some don't? Where does that come from in a school? It, Terry? It, it usually comes from one of those champions um, and and they're not all called champions but they are people within the school who really want to make a difference students and or staff? no their staff okay. their staff so yeah. sometimes it's an EA sometimes it's a youth service worker sometimes it's a staff member often it's a person that has had personal experience um, maybe in their family or their friends and want to make sure that there are supports for students so I guess I would call those the champions that were there before we started looking for champions, and they voluntarily formed the GSA within a school, and it's it's run usually at lunch times for students um, to come. Yeah, and it seems to check a lot of boxes yeah. from from that perspective. I, I like the idea. I just wonder how you roll it out yeah. and have one in every school, so to speak. And it, it it provides that safe place. It really does. And then again, back that link to administration or staff. I think that 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 exists there too as well. Thank you. Is there any other questions from the committee members? All right. Um, I do want to thank you in. Uh, Trish kind of stole my question there at the last minute. I was uh, going to ask. Uh, yeah, going to ask about that. But, um, yeah, no, it, you know, I, I think it is uh, something that maybe uh, the committee will look at at a different time or possibly thing. But I do want to thank you both coming in um, for, I know it was a little bit delayed, but maybe that may have been more beneficial because at least now we have a little bit more information. So uh, I do want to thank you both for coming in. So we will take a brief little break and then we will come and finish our agenda. Or do you want to do it right now? Let's do it right now, committee. No, we're done. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we can continue on with our guests here. Uh, yeah, if you want. Perfect. I can do it. Um, so, yeah, if you guys want to get up and go, you're good. We just have a few more items on our agenda. Thanks again for coming in. Um, we, the committee members, we will just continue with our, our agenda. So, uh, number five on our uh, agenda is new business. Is there any new business? All right, I'll ask for a motion for adjournment. Trish Altes, thank you very much, and thank you all for coming today.